Hello, my name is Jeremy and this is my podcast. The real world sometimes crashes together with the fantasy world in a horrific mess. I have a short story about that for you today. Other times, I like to share my thoughts on more everyday topics. So this time, my story is about chalk doodles and their spooky peculiarity. It's not a horror story, I would say. It has more of an urban legend undertone and definitely no gore or cursing. Chalk. Every evening, after I finish work and lock up the office, I wait at a busy bus stop. I'm always entertained by the passing cars and people, all looking like neon glow-in-the-dark jellyfish floating around. Glowing tubes and animated rectangles turn us all a gloomy blue, then a threateningly strong neon pink, then a moment of clarity with white before another color tints the world. There's my bus, number 32. I get on and look around. There's always at least one familiar face on the bus home. This time, it's too late for the children and elderly faces I recognize, But the neatly dressed businessman with kind eyes and a limp gets off at the same stop as usual. If work ends while it's light out, I get to see an ordinary looking boy, pale skin, buzz cut, plump rosy cheeks and wide brown eyes and a backpack that looks like it carries all the worries of the world in it. Then there's a peculiar old woman. She's always practically running with her cane, Probably not hunched over due to age, but for aerodynamic reasons. Her old bitty bag with wheels races along behind her, never catching up, but always the only contender for second place as we all jump out of her way. And a woman with such a familiar face. She looks like someone I've had to talk to at the town hall or while handing in some bank paperwork but I can never be quite sure if it was her or another middle-aged short perm with glasses. Hmm. I've never talked to any of these Bus 32 folks, but I wonder if they remember me. I wonder how they see me. I wonder if they think about where I am when I'm ill or on holiday and I don't participate in our bus rides. I stroll down the street, past the refugee center, dark and quiet, past the Georgian restaurant next to it, bustling with laughing people, a brisk guitar tune floating out of the open doors. I excuse myself as I make my way through the throng of gleeful loud smokers on the sidewalk. They smell like wine and perfume, a dizzying mix with the smoke. What greets me next is a hopscotch court, partly colored in and adorned with shapes and figures around it. I smile and go through the jumps mentally. I wouldn't enjoy hopscotch in front of the drunken band behind me. Maybe another time the children will draw it a bit closer to home. The happy drawings continue as I turn down an alley to my apartment building. An old, badly built four-story building with cheap rents and high energy costs due to the thin walls. A neon powdery smiling figure with glasses, another in a dress holding a flower, greets me from the sidewalk in. Hmm? A hunched old lady with a crooked cane and a tall hat, somehow riding a broom while using her cane. <laughs> I chuckle and wonder if they'll draw something more tomorrow. I turn one more dark corner and I'm home. I fumble around, find my keys, and trudge upstairs. Another peaceful evening featuring a novel I bought that week and some takeout ravioli. The days pass. Rain washes away the chalk until the lines are thick powdery blurs smeared into obscurity. But the children, never to be defeated, create more plants and animals and bright powders to decorate our side street. One June afternoon, I'm in a great mood, I get on my bus home. 
It's a bit cloudy. I hear rumbling in the distance. I clutch my umbrella. I don't think I'll go ride my bike this evening. There are so many books to read and series to watch. I ponder over what to treat myself to with this extra free time when the clouds are violently ripped open by a flash of lightning. The nervous aged race car seems to jump out of her skin at the deafening clap of thunder. The man in a blazer gets his black folding umbrella out of his black briefcase. I absently look out the window to find I cannot. It's as if I'm trying to peer through a waterfall on the glass. I frown at my sneakers. I consider my umbrella. I'll have to run. The bus doors open again with a hiss and I get out, struggling to open my umbrella as fast as I can while stepping right into a puddle. The fast old lady gets out too. I hold my umbrella over her. She's worse off if she's drenched than I am. She doesn't have her folding trolley with her, so she's even harder to keep up with. She notices the umbrella over her instantly and tells me she doesn't need it, thank you. I smile and shout, it's all right, over the downpour as I try to keep it over her while not stepping into every single puddle. She starts talking about the bloody weather and telling me that it's all right if I go my way. She lives close by, so I tell her we live in the same direction, that I'll leave her when our ways separate. She accepts, and we hurry on at a breakneck speed down the street. By the time we're sprinting past the refugee center, my shoes, socks, and my jeans are heavy with water. My jacket is keeping my torso relatively dry, although my shoulders are already damp as well. Nothing can stand in the way of this torrential downpour. Pink, green, and white water pours into the drain, leaving the sidewalk a clean palette for the young artists. She turns right, I say goodbye, and run the last few meters home. I'll be right as rain after a hot shower. After drying myself in my clothes, I dreamily touch the bathroom wall. Cool, smooth, with tiny droplets of water from my shower. I don't think chalk holds on tile, no little cavities for the powder to stay in. I walk, dragging my finger down the tiles to the wall of my bedroom. It almost feels chalky. Dry, bumpy, perfect for some whimsical inspiration. But no, that's not my style. I wouldn't like such a silly mural on my wall. Plus, there's no rain to wash away any blunders and regrets, so I could try again. White walls should stay white walls. And with such pleasant nonsense, my day ends. It's been a few days now, and I feel uneasy getting on the bus. The old woman said such strange things, such disconcerting oddities. I'm glad she doesn't know where exactly I live. In spite of my stomach being a bit clenched every time I board the bus home, she's never there. But the sunny days bring relief, and more silly drawings of families, flowers, and hopscotch. I walk home, and the hunched old lady, in her neon green robes with a neon yellow cane, is on the wall of my building right next to the doorbells. I'm not sure if I should laugh or frown, it's... It's similar to graffiti, which is vandalism. But never mind that, this chalky old bat is harmless and she'll be gone with the next summer storm. I unlock, go upstairs, and forget all about it. The next day brings a mild rain, and the neon chalk crone isn't at the door, as expected. I walk upstairs, and there she is! Comically pointy nose, hunched back, and... Hmm, a shopping bag on wheels? Out of my anger comes surprise. Why give her such an accessory? Do modern witches need them when they go gather ingredients for potions in children's stories? Perhaps, perhaps. But no matter. Drawing her right in front of my little loft is too much. I'll ask around and find out whose children play with chalk between the apartment buildings, and their parents will hear from me tomorrow. 
Tonight it's dark rainy and I've just about had enough for one day. I'll save my anger for the weekend, for tomorrow when I have strength again. I grumble through the apartment and have a very bitter dinner. I huff through a chapter of my adventure novel and get ready for bed. On a corner near the door, I spy a powdery smear. The fiery rage in my heart rekindled. I leap to it and rub it between my fingers to inspect it. Of course it's chalk. Did those little vandals break into my apartment as well? Is this just a game to them, making my life miserable? And who are their parents to allow them to do such things? I sit at my dining table in my pajamas and write a letter of complaint, readying it for morning. I put it in an envelope and leave it by the door so I can grab it and go the moment I wake up. I finally turn off the lights, stomp to bed, and lay down. It's Monday morning. Several uniformed officers and a forensic specialist stand in the doorway of a loft apartment as they ponder a nonsensical letter. A detective stands over an empty bed, a silly cartoon witch drawn in a child's hand over it. The stairwell is void of chalk. The witch is a bit high for a child to draw, even if it stood on the bed. A stick figure of a man with a briefcase is drawn outside on the sidewalk. The End